Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, I guess we're on, and uh, good to see everybody in this afternoon, and especially those of you from out of state. We have Indiana and Illinois and Texas and uh, various other places outside of Tulsa. We just want to make you feel welcome and at home in our group. Because after all, you know, uh, people across the land get used to seeing these same faces all the time. And they feel like they know you as well as they do me. And of course, that's only by TV association. But anyway, we're uh, glad to have you all in. And for those of you joining us out there on television, we just thank you for tuning in. And we thank you for your loyalty. Because, you know, everybody that writes or speak to us at seminars, the first thing they say is, I watch you every day. Well, now that's a lot better audience than somebody that just listens once in a while. So we do. We appreciate your loyalty, your prayers, your letters, your financial help. And uh, yes, I can still honestly say that we do read your letters. And now we don't want them long for that very reason or we'd never get finished. But uh, keep them short and to the point. Unless, of course, now if you've got a testimony and uh, it takes a page or two to give that, we don't mind. But... Uh, on the, on the ordinary, we appreciate short notes, and uh, that way we can keep in contact with all of you out there. All right, this is a Bible study for someone that might be catching us for the first time. We're an informal Bible study, as you can tell, and uh, we just simply go by what the book says. We don't try to deviate the Greek and try to figure out how the Greek could have been mistranslated and all this other stuff that we're hearing today. That's the bad part of the computers now, you know. The computers are throwing out so much information that uh, now they think that uh, they know it all. And you know the old cliche as well as I do, a little knowledge is frightening. And uh, so you have to uh, take all that in consideration. All right, now let's go right back in a continuation of where we left off in our last program. I didn't feel that I had sufficiently finished the Abrahamic Covenant. And uh, we touched on Romans chapter 11, but uh, I want to come back to it for this first half hour and uh, more or less complete it. All right, now we're dealing with the covenant that was made with Abraham way back 2000 B.C. in Genesis chapter 12. And that common covenant said in so many ways that God was going to make of that one man, Abram, a new nation, race of people, and that God would bless the man himself and the crowning act of the whole thing was that through Abram, or later on Abraham, the whole human race would be blessed. And that, of course, came about when the Messiah of Israel, who came as a result of the covenant promises, went the way of the cross, purchased salvation for the whole human race. Not just Israel, but for everyone. And it all rested, of course, on that Abrahamic covenant. And that's why I don't think you can exhaust studying it. All right, so now we come to Paul's reference to the Abrahamic covenant, which is, of course, primarily the nation of Israel. And uh, we'll start right with verse 1. And what a statement in light of so much of the stuff that we're being bombarded with today. And here's what he says, Romans 11, verse 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? Has he given up on the nation of Israel? Have they disappeared like they're trying to tell us? Well, the scripture answers the question. God forbid. And a better translation there, I think, is don't even think such a thing. God could not cast away his people because of all the promises that we've been seeing coming up through the covenants in the last several programs. How could he cast away everything that he ever said? But you see, we've got this one huge group. They're making such tremendous inroads today. And they call themselves preterists. For years, I called them amillennialists. And they believe that 70 AD, the nation of Israel disappeared. The other day, I had a huge brown envelope, that thick, typewriter size pages. And I didn't even bother to look or who wrote it or where it came from, but I opened it. And I have what probably some people call a bad habit. I think it's the best one I've ever had. 
And that is, anything I get, a book, or an editorial, or a news magazine, I go to the back page first. Can't help it. Iris will bring a library book and I go to the back page first. <laughs> but anyway, that's my habit. If I open a news magazine, and you know, the editors know that. Now, I'm not alone. So what's usually on the back page now of your news magazine? The editorial. The Daily Oklahoman. The editorial page isn't in the front or the middle, it's almost the back page. So anyway, I open this great big manuscript, whatever you want to call it, so I go to the back page. And what do you suppose his last paragraph says? Boy, what a time saver. So all this is to prove that the Jews that claim to be Jews today are not Jews at all. Well, handily, the round file was right there. <laughs> and that's all I need. So if the guy's listening, I hope he knows better than to spend $3 in postage next time. Save it. I won't read that garbage. But see, this is what they're bombarding the, even the Christian world with, that God did away with the Jews after the Titus invasion of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and that the Jews of today have no relationship whatsoever with the Jews of Scripture. Well, if that's the case, then three-fourths of this book can just as well be torn out and thrown away, because it all promises that God will never give up on the nation of Israel, and Paul confirms it right here in chapter 11. Has God cast away his people? Have they disappeared? Don't even think such a thing. Because God's word is true. And as we've been showing over the last several programs, especially in the covenant promises, God has promised that the sun will fall out of its position before Israel will disappear as a nation. And yet these people just totally ignore all that. And then here's the crowning one in the New Testament. Has God cast away his people? God forbid. He can't. Or his word would become of no use. All right, and Paul is living proof. He goes on now. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Now we're going to see in our following programs how that everything since the dawn of human history with Adam and Eve has been by God's design. He's in control of everything for 6,000 years. And so this is what Paul is reminding us. God will never let the nation of Israel disappear because in his foreknowledge he has them ready for the end time return of Christ to set up his kingdom. They have to be here. All right, now I'm going to take a few of these verses and, and just sort of skim over them. And uh, he says in verse uh, 3, Lord, they have killed the prophets. And we know the Old Testament Jews did over and over. They've digged down thy altars. And Elijah said, I'm left alone, and they seek my life. Now Paul writes, but what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved myself 7,000 men. There's that remnant. 7,000 out of Israel's population of usually 7 to 10 million. So, you math people, what's the percentage? One-tenth of one percent. All right, now we'll read on, and then when we get to the word remnant, I'm going to go back and show you what it really means. All right, so that remnant of one-tenth of one percent, they didn't bow their knee to Baal. They remained true to Jehovah. Now Paul brings them up to his present day, and he says, even then at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election now of grace. All right, now let's go back to Isaiah, honey. Isaiah chapter 1. That this is not a new phenomenon. I was reading a book last night by a British prophecy expert. And he was pointing up how close we are to the end. And of course, being a Brit, he was more acquainted with what's going on in England and Europe. And it's frightening frightening of what is really taking place in Western civilization. And he quoted what some of the bishops of the Church of England had been telling young people, and, and it's just unbelievable. And so he made the same point. The believing element in the world today is just a small remnant. Well, that's nothing new. Don't be shocked. Because here we are, 700 years before Christ, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. 700 years before Christ, amongst the nation of Israel, the chosen race. Verse 9. 
except the Lord of hosts had left unto us, that is the nation of Israel, a very small remnant, then we, the nation, would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. Had it not been for the little one-tenth of one percent, what would God have done? Destroyed the nation. And it's ever been that way. Now we'll probably see in our next program, we're going to go back to Noah. And I've always maintained there must have been around four or five billion people at the time of Noah's flood. How many were saved? How many were believers? Eight! Not eight million, not eight thousand, not eight hundred. Eight! Out of four billion, five billion people. What was that? A little tiny remnant. And so it's always been, and even today, amongst Christendom. My, they like to tell us there are 50, 60 million Christians in America. I wish that were true, but I'm afraid it's a stretch because the vast majority of even our well-churched people don't have a clue about salvation through faith and by God's grace alone. And it's so sad. Well, anyway, here we have this whole concept that it's only the small percentage. All right, now they come down to verse 7. Still in Romans 11. Or back to Romans 11. I didn't want to leave you in Isaiah, did I? <clears throat> back to Romans 11. Verse 7. What then? Israel has not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election, or those who truly believed, obtained it. Now we got to stop. What was the nation of Israel constantly looking and hoping for? The Messiah, who would bring in that heaven on earth kingdom environment. But when the son Messiah came, in unbelief they rejected him. Except for the few. That little small flock of believers who Paul refers to here as the remnant. But what happened to the vast majority of Israel? <coughs> Blinded. Blinded. And to this day it's almost impossible to speak to a Jew about Jesus Christ. Now I've been getting the, the little mission magazine Israel My Glory for years and years. And uh, one of my favorite articles is, again, on the last page, written by a converted Jew, a survivor of the Holocaust, and he's always sharing his experience of trying to testify or witness the Lord Jesus Christ to fellow Jews there in Jerusalem. And you'd be amazed at how they hate him for it. But that's the typical response of the Jew. They're blinded, providentially. Until the day when God's going to open their eyes and they're suddenly going to again become the favored nation and they'll recognize their Messiah when he comes the second time. All right, but that's not where we want to spend my time. I wanted to come on down now to some of the aspects that the Abrahamic covenant can never be abrogated. All right, let's come all the way down then to verse 11. And here again. For these preterists, what do they do with verses like this? As a rule, I, I don't fault people of, who disagree with me, but this is becoming so obnoxious, and the material that's coming in my mail just bombarding me with it, and uh, so I can hardly hold my patience much longer. But see, what do they do with this? Verse 11, I say then, have they, the nation of Israel, have they stumbled? that they should fall? Well, of course they stumbled, but did they fall out of all of God's dealing for the end time? Never! Of course they stumbled in unbelief. And of course God uprooted them and dispersed them into the nations of the world. But did He obliterate them as a nation of people? No way! And everything that's happening in the world today is a fulfilling of those promises that after they'd been dispersed into every nation in the world, God would bring them back. And He's been doing it. And He's still doing it. And people are blind to that. I don't see how anybody can miss it. That those Jews are not there in that bustling, beautiful city of Jerusalem. Unbelievable, wasn't it, you guys? I know you, did, you were shocked. We were there just a few weeks ago. 
It's shocking how huge and how busy that city of Jerusalem has become. And the Arab world thinks they're still going to run them into the sea. You know, as we were driving through the streets with all that traffic, I almost had to laugh within myself. Who do they think they're kidding? Who brought them in there and gave them all this? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there isn't enough force in this whole world to oppose the God of Abraham. And so they're there. And this is what Paul is talking about. Yes, they stumbled when they rejected the Messiah, but they didn't fall out of God's program for the future. All right, read on. But rather through their fall, through their unbelief, rejecting the Messiah, crucifying him, and bringing about the resurrection and all that pertains to our gospel, it was all because of Israel's unbelief. So through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles to really provoke the nation of Israel to jealousy, to think that the God of Abraham is now turning to the Gentile world. All right, now then, verse 12. Now just keep reminding yourself what I'm saying. How can this be true if the Jew has disappeared 1900 years ago? Then we might as well throw the book away and go home. Now if the fall of them Israel's rejecting their Messiah. If the fall of them be the riches of the world, the whole world, and the diminishing of them, they're being taken out of their homeland and dispersed among the nations, and the diminishing of them brings about the riches of the Gentile, which is what happened because of the gospel of grace. It went out to the whole human race, rich and full and free. Whereas they've been diminished and have been blinded and are out in a dispersion up until now in our lifetime. Then look at the last question. If all of this has accomplished what we've seen it accomplished, then how much more their what? Their fullness. And what's that? When they will finally, in opened eyes of belief, see the return of their Messiah the establishing of that earthly kingdom. That's their fullness, and it's still in their future, see? Okay, now then, verse 13, Paul reminds us that he's merely giving us all these facts concerning the nation of Israel, even though he is the apostle of the Gentiles. And oh, people don't want to swallow that. It, it, it just rankles them. Paul, I had someone tell me again the other day, that they were trying to talk to one of their pastors. The guy says, Paul, we don't even look at Paul. We don't have a thing to do with him. Well, that, that's running rampant through Christendom, see? But Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. He's God's spokesman for us who are not Jews. All right, I magnify my office. And then the reason for his apostleship is that he might save some. All right, now here we come back to Israel again. We've got to move quickly. For if the casting away of them sending them out into the dispersion. And if the casting of them be the reconciling of the world, that is, the rest of the world. In other words, by Israel's rejecting and bringing about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah, and that opened up the whole plan of salvation for the rest of the world. Well, if that act of unbelief has brought about such a response for salvation for so many Gentiles, what shall the receiving of them back into the promises, what is it but like, what? Life from the dead. Well, isn't that exactly what's pictured back there in Ezekiel 37, the dry bones? The valleys are white with dry bones. Those are symbolic pictures of Jews out in the dispersion for these hundreds and hundreds of years. But what did Ezekiel see? The bones coming back to life. They hooked up together. They formed skeletons. Flesh came upon. It was all a symbolic picture of the Jew coming back to his homeland and becoming once again a nation among the nations. And we've all seen it happen. And what is it? Like a miracle of resurrection itself, life from the dead. All right, now then, I'm going to come down to uh, verse 17. If some of the branches be broken off, which of course is what God did with the Jew when he sent him into the dispersion, 
If some of the branches be broken off, and thou, now he's talking to us Gentiles, remember, <clears throat> and if we're part of the wild olive tree, <clears throat> and we were grafted in among them, that is, all the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's why we've been studying the covenants and how we're related to them. We were grafted in among them, and we have been partakers of the root and the fatness of the original olive tree. Now what's he talking about? <clears throat> this whole book, from cover to cover, was written by what people? Jews. That's why I maintain Luke couldn't have been a Gentile. This book was written by Jews. And you and I are feasting on what God accomplished through the Jewish people. On top of that, Jesus came to earth as a Jew. He went through his earthly ministry <clears throat> as a Jew, under the law. Anything he accomplished that had to be reported to the priest, what did he tell them? Go show yourself to the priests according to the law. And so everything that you and I enjoy under this age of grace is because of Israel. You can't take them out of the picture. I don't care how hard they try. And so here we are. We're boasting in the root and the fatness of Abraham. <clears throat> now then, verse 18. You and I as Gentile believers cannot get proud and puffed up and look down on the Jew and say, look what we've accomplished that you could have had and didn't get. No, we dare not do that. So we boast not against the branches, <clears throat> but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root is bearing you. You see what he's saying? He's telling you and I as believers, don't get proud and puffed up and act as though we're the ones that have brought about Israel's possibility for salvation someday. No. Israel's still going to rest on those same roots and the tree that began with the Abrahamic covenant. And one day it's going to come back into full force and the nation of Israel will be blessed like they've never been blessed before. All right, now we'll come down to verse 19. Again, Paul is talking to you and I as Gentiles. And he says, you as a Gentile will then say, the branches were broken off. That is, the nation of Israel, taken out of the place of blessing. You will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Now what's the danger? That we get proud and puffed up and say, see, you Jews were nothing. And there's a lot of people that try to say that. How does the average Muslim refer to a Jew? He's a pig. He's less than human. And a lot of Gentiles are just as bad. A lot in Christendom are just about as bad. But we dare not take that attitude. It's got to be the other way around. We've been blessed to partake of these covenant promises, even though they've been set aside because of their unbelief. See? All right. Verse 20. I ran ahead of myself. Well, that's okay that you may think that, but you better rethink it again. Because of unbelief, see that? Israel's unbelief, they were broken off. They were sent into dispersion. They were given that spirit of blindness. And God turned to the Gentile world through the Apostle Paul, see? All right, so now he's reminding us, don't be high-minded, don't get proud and puffed up, but you better have some reverential fear. In other words, we better understand how blessed we are because of Israel's unbelief back there at the time of Christ's earthly ministry. All right, now then verse 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, if he judged Israel because of their unbelief? Do you think he's going to shrink from judging the Gentile world because of their unbelief? Not for a minute. And the world is getting closer every day. You know, I was just reminded the other day by from some company we had from a distant state. 
and how many multiple murders were taking place in their particular area of the country. And lo and behold, the Daily Oklahoman had headline front page news of four people murdered over here in southeast Oklahoma City. And now we're finding out it's almost epidemic across the country. Not single murders, multiple. Multiple. All right? And so he says here, be careful that we will not bring in his wrath and his judgment because of unbelief, just like he did with Israel. All right, now then, verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them who fell. Here we come back to Israel again because of their unbelief. It was severe. Their city was destroyed. Their temple was destroyed. Almost a million Jews lost their life in that Roman invasion. And the rest were scattered into the nations of the world because of God's wrath against them and their unbelief. But hey, is the Gentile world going to miss it? Not for a minute. Their judgment is coming, and it's coming faster and faster every day. All right, so he says, don't be like they were. Don't stay in unbelief, but continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off, and we know they will be. Now verse 23, and they also, that is Israel, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, and what's the word? Again. Now goodness, you know plain English. If they've been taken away from the root and the fatness, and they're going to be grafted in again, what does that tell you? They're going to come back into the place of blessing. How can they if they've disappeared from the scene? You see what a big lie the whole thing turns out to be? But they will be grafted in again. They will enjoy their Messiah at his second coming. All right, now then I'm going to have to forsake a time, come all the way down to verse 25. And what's going to be the indication of all this? Verse 25, where Paul says, I would not, brethren, that is to you and I, that we should be ignorant of this secret, lest we become wild in our own conceit, that blindness in part, that is for a period of time, it's now been 1900 and some years, but that blindness in part has happened to Israel, and they still are, but it's going to end one day, and when will that be? When the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in. And what's the fullness of the Gentile? When the body of Christ is complete. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.